Thank you so much, Vicky, and good morning, everybody. And thank you so much for sticking with it today. And you know what happens now, it's after morning tea, so what, do you all know what happens now? The blood, where's the blood going? From the brain down to the gut. And we all know what the gut is, as Peter pointed out. So, one of my challenges today is to keep you awake for the next 30 minutes. I'm going to do that as best I can. But who would like a better memory? Who would, and who would like to feel less lethargic? I think we could all say yes to that. But what if I told you that at your disposal, you had a resource that could improve your memory by 14%. Would you be interested? Yes. And what about if that same resource then could actually increase your brain reaction times by 40% and reduce depressive symptoms by 30%? Yes. So I'm really Does that sound of interest? Yes. Yes. Right, well, that's what we're talking about today. So I'm glad you're in the right spot. But before I do that, I would just like to acknowledge, respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the lands from across Queensland. And we pay our respects to the elders past and present, for they are the holders of the memories, traditions, the culture, and the aspirations of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples across Queensland. So if you said yes to that, then the good news is that change is possible and change can actually happen very quickly within a few days to a few weeks. So today, this session around nutrition and regulating energy work, a lot of it's about the brain, right? Because this is, this is what we use, that's our tool. We, we, are, we are knowledge workers, we, we're not labourers, I assume I'm not seeing any labourers in the room, but most of us have office jobs and with it, this is our go-to tool. We need this one to be working for us. And so that's what today is about. How can we keep the brain in its best, best possible state through healthy eating? And I appreciate and what Peter has said as well as, as Samantha, you know, it's more than just nutrition, but how can we use good nutrition and better eating to make sure that we keep this part of it, our tool, our basic tool? So we do know that healthy eating patterns, I'm talking about patterns there, that they will benefit concentration and focus and memory, increase vitality and increase your energy throughout the day. So that's very important. But on the other hand, most Australians are, are eating a diet that doesn't aid that at all. Most of the, the, the typical diet in Australia is leaving us feeling irritable. It's leaving us feel lethargic and you get brain fog and you're feeling depressed. Because we're not eating enough of these types of foods. Fruits and vegetables and the whole grains. And so only 5% only of adults are eating enough vegetables. And that, that should be a bit of a striking stat. It's only about 30% eat enough fruit, and that's, that's adults, and you know, that's probably among us as well. And it's no, no better when it comes to the whole grain foods. So these things are all super important to us, but we're eating way too much of this sort of stuff. And that is, that is the typical Australian way of eating, so highly processed foods, high in fat, and salt and sugar, they're, they're energy dense. So this is style of eating, this pattern of eating, the common diet that we have in Australia that is weighing us down and, and quite literally it's contributing to our, our waistlines and feeling irritable. It's these kind of foods now as well as the drinks that, that make up about 35% of our total daily energy intake. And that, that's on average in Australia. So that if, you, if you're into counting calories or you understand that language then about 3,000 kilojoules a day will come from these types of ultra-processed foods. Or that's about 710 calories a day, if you think, you think in those terms. So it's actually quite a lot. I mean, it's, it's over at least 35%. It's about 30% of our total energy needs in total. So it's a lot. And the other point is that it's actually coming from a huge variety of foods as well. So these, this is a... This is from dietary studies and it looks across the age groups. And what this one is showing is just where the contribution of all these extra foods is coming from. And right down the bottom there, they're the, they're the drinks. So you can't see what happens to these as we go through the different stages of life. But what remains quite very big there are those blue ones, biscuits and cakes and meat pies, sausages. All those sort of sweet drinks are in there as well. But you can see the contribution that these foods are making. They're, they're not they're not seldom foods. They're not discretionary foods. They're like they're day, they're not even they're daily foods, but they're multiple times a day kind of foods. And that's what the typical diet is looking at, looking like. So 
the red bar there, you can see how the red, the red part of the portion is kind of goes up. Um, Mr. Chardonnay, I think. <laughs> Dr. Chardonnay. Dr. Chardonnay. Dr. Chardonnay. He's a good therapist. So the other point about this, and this is a really important point, is that this style of, this way of eating, our typical style of eating, is toxic to our microbiome. And now I've had, heard it said that we've been waging war on our microbiome for the last hundred years. And that's, that weighs about two or three kilos and it sits in your large intestine and it has the most amazing benefits to the body. We've already heard from you know, Samantha and Pete this morning just about the impact on you know, cardiovascular disease and diabetes, etc. The, the microbiome has a big impact on that, but it also regulates a whole lot of other things in your body. So appetite regulation, energy regulation, metabolism, it makes hormones, they come out of the microbiome. So you can imagine if we're waging war through, through our diet and stress, I think as Samantha pointed out, if we're waging war on that, then it's gonna have big impacts on, on our health. It's also gonna have big impacts on our level, our ability to concentrate as well, because that's where a lot of that comes from. So there's a, you know, serotonin, non it's made in the gut, a lot of that comes from the microbiome. Uh, that's the happy hormone. And so if we're waging war on that, then our body's just not going to be functioning quite so well. If you want to increase memory and concentration and ability to focus, then there are other important things, but we can't ignore the impact that the microbiome makes in this context as well. So what I put there is a, I've put a piece of paper on, on each of your tables there. And what I wanted to do is just we're going to build on this as we go through, but just a short activity, very, very short activity for a couple of minutes. But what I would invite you to do is to look at activity one and just to bring a bit of awareness to what your daily pattern is. So just note down there, you know, maybe when you wake. Oh, great. I'll, I'll come around. But just note on there. Yeah, when you wake, uh, what, when your meals might be, uh, when you do activity. Don't, it doesn't have to be in a lot of detail, it's not say what do you eat, but it's more just noting the time of the day when that might happen. And I'll bring, that's so how we got two minutes to do that. All right, that's probably enough time for that. You can do it on it later if you, if you need to. So I wanted to move on and talk about the the Goldilocks of the brain and the Goldilocks and darkness. Has anyone heard of the Goldilocks of the brain before? Um, great. So the brain, the brain is an incredibly energy hungry machine. So we know that it, it weighs only about 2% of your body weight, but it uses 20% of all the energy that your body produces. So it's massively overrated. And the only fuel source that your brain can use is glucose, so from sugar. So that's its, that's its only under normal circumstances. Obviously, under a domestically fasted state, it would it would use other food sources. But but generally, for us, most of the time, it uses it, its only energy source is glucose, and all of, and and it uses sixty percent of all the glucose that your body makes. So it's massively reliant on glucose to function well, and it's massively sensitive, therefore to changes in what the glucose is doing in your blood. So you've probably heard of or experienced hangry before. <laughs> Everyone knows hangry. So just have a think about what's happening when you're hangry or what's going on. So sugar levels probably dropping in your blood because you haven't eaten for a while. So your brain's starting to get a bit irritable and that will make you a little bit testy. And what happens then? is that your brain's going, I want food, I want food, I need something to get that sugar level back up. And then we're more likely to overreach for sugary snacks at that point. Now we're, we're gonna go and talk about what goes on during, during that cycle. But because the, because the brain condition is so, is so sensitive like that, it's all about the prefrontal cortex here that Pete talked about, that you remember does our executive function and our memory and our ability to process information and do that quickly. It's incredibly sensitive to to blood glucose levels. So everything has to be right for the for the prefrontal cortex to work well. For the Goldilocks of the brain, it has to be just right. And if it's not just right, it'll, your body will start to try and make it right. 
and that's when we can start to get swings and get ourselves in trouble. But I do want to spend a moment to just go through what blood sugar levels might do during the day and then, and then we'll have a look at what that might look like for you. So has everyone seen a, a, a chart like this before? This is, the red line is just demonstrating what happens to blood sugar level in your blood. So when you wake up in the morning, clearly it's slow because you haven't eaten for some time and then you have breakfast and the blood level spikes up and then your body starts to produce insulin, etc., to bring it back down again. So it's that sort of constant monitoring and keeping in homeostasis in a, in a right level. Then it comes down again and there's other hormones released to kind of try and bring it back up again or at least to alert you to the fact that it's slow. So, yeah, then there's a mid-morning snack and yeah, then it drops again, then it goes up to lunch, etc. So that sort of goes up and down through the day like that. And, and that's a fairly, what we've got here is a fairly good level. You can see that it's ranging between four and about six and a half, and that's great. It's when it starts to kind of go above that, you get the spikes up and the lows down, which you can see from the, from the dotted line, and that's the donut. Like you get there and you're, well this one's showing it about lunchtime, I don't know who eats a donut at lunchtime, but you might have a particularly sugary lunch, but for us, for what we know, for most of us that might happen later on in the afternoon when we have a sugary snack. But you take the donut and it's got all that sugar in it and then you eat that and your blood sugar level is, is spiking up, so insulin's coming out and it's trying to bring it down. But if your eating pattern is is full of a lot of those kind of foods or it's pretty erratic through the day, then what your body's trying to do is, is get control of that. So up goes the insulin and down it comes again and then up again it goes. Um, cortisol's being released when it's coming down. The purpose of that is to get you to pay attention. So then you can find something useful to eat and try and bring it back up again and keep it. But it's the, you want to try and stop it swinging up and down to these big levels through the day, but keep it within, within normal limits. And that's where the idea of snacking is really important and having, having frequent meals through the day. So part of that exercise that we just did before was a bit about prompting. So, uh, you know, if you don't eat until 11 a.m., for example, well, what's going on there? You know, what might be happening in your body from wake-up time and what's, what impact is that going to have on the ability for you to be productive and to, to think and be able to focus at work? And that's kind of what we're talking about here, how to, how to manage that side of things. So now I've got, I think, potentially a more challenging task for you, which is thinking about what you, what you wrote down before in that earlier activity. Just, and there's a, on, the, on the flip side of that piece of paper, there, is a, there was a chart there that, that looks a little bit like that one. So I don't think, I'm not asking you to kind of draw the line, but just thinking about your, what your daily pattern looks like. When might your blood sugar levels be high and when might they be low? And when might they be at risk of being low? So you don't have to, you can draw the line if you like. It's, it's not to be precise and accurate about this, it's just to bring awareness about when it might be, when it might be going low or when you notice that it might be going low if you do. And you can kind of relate that then to the time gap between meals. So that's the purpose of that. So we'll just spend a, just spend a quick moment on, on looking at that. Again, it's just about trying to bring some awareness to where that might be. So, so think about what time you have, have breakfast. When do you eat first in the day? What's the gap between lunch and dinner? And, and do you have anything to eat between those two times in the day? Apart from Dr. Chardonnay, what are you looking for at 5 p.m.? At the end of a work day, yeah. Yeah. do you feel exhausted? And is it crackers and cheese and Dr. Chardonnay, for example, at five or six p.m. before dinner? And and why might that be the case? Like, think about what's happened in the lead up to that. So, it, don't worry if it's don't worry if it's too difficult to do, but it's just an idea to, to bring a little bit of awareness to that. My example was earlier in the week that I was going to a morning tea on Monday and that got cancelled because the person going was, uh, was sick that day and couldn't come in. So I'd planned for that, so I hadn't, I hadn't brought enough food to cover that and then I had 
So I had lunch and a snack, and, but I ran out of that food pretty quickly by lunchtime because I'd eaten it in the first half of the day. And so I was trying to work away there in the afternoon and, and you know, I don't know whether you find it, but towards the end of the day, you, every, you seem to type every word twice. <laughs> I type it and back, 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 top, top, top. And you kind of know that it's not happening, you know, the, the speed of processing is not fast enough up here because it's sugar. It, it, it's tired related as well, but, but blood sugar level can be a part of it. In my case, it was blood sugar level. And I saw a cooking that was on the, on the bench in the kitchen that someone had put there. And so my brain goes, cooking. Do <laughs> <laughs> you think I could get that out of my brain? I'm going, I don't, I don't particularly want to cook you, but I was hungry, cooking. <laughs> no, 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 we can make a Okay, cookie, all right, cookie, all right. All right, I'll have a cookie. So I went and had a cookie. And so this was very nice. And I thought, oh, that was good. And then I saw there were two flavours there. <laughs> there was a chocolate one there as well. So I, I said, no, that's it, just one cookie. I came back, sat at the desk. And what, what do you think happened? Cookie. Cookie. <laughs> what about the chocolate one? That'd be nice, isn't it? <laughs> cookie. All right, okay, I'll do, the, I'll do the cookie. So I went back and had the cookie. So I had two cookies and, and fair enough, my brain started feeling a whole lot better after that and I was not typing every word two or three times after that. And then it goes, cookie. <laughs> Have another cookie. So I was at that point able to resist the third cookie. I think that comes back to some of the things that Pete said, you know, it's a, that's what's going on here, your ability to kind of process and function well and to think clearly. Uh, it, it, needs, it needs that blood glucose to be able to do that. Thank you very much for spending a little bit of time on that. I hope that was in some ways enlightening and useful uh, and, and you can keep building on that. So the next part of I just wanted to move on to was about, so that's about blood sugar level and regulating that. Now, I'm sure that you've all heard about brain foods, right? They're always in the media, oh, this now they've discovered the vitamin K in something and we should all go out and eat heaps of broccoli because that's going to be good for our brain. Or we hear a lot with, with salmon and walnuts and things with omega threes, and you know, no, oh, that's going to prevent Alzheimer's and dementia, and so we need to eat more of that. And we do need to eat more of those foods, absolutely. So, but my, my point here is, is that we, these, these scientific discoveries come, and you can go into brain foods on, the, on Google, and it comes up with a big long list. And you know, I've done it, there's 12, what are the 10 foods you need to eat? And you get blueberries and kale and broccoli and salmon and nuts and go, okay, well, what do I do now? Like I, I, I don't go, I'm, I, I need to eat more omega-3 today so I'm gonna eat some salmon or, or I wanna get my vitamin K up so I'm gonna eat kale. And we don't eat that. We put foods together in a much more of a complex way to build patterns of eating. And the one message I want to just leave you with today is that it's about the, the pattern of eating. It's the pattern of eating that you do every day that is what is going to make the difference. It's not, oh, I need to go out and eat salmon. You'll eat salmon for two weeks and go, I'm sick of salmon. You know, what do I do now? What's the next, what's the next superfood? So the game here is not about what, what is going on. Um, it's not about individual foods, basically. It's not, oh, you need more of that, you need more of that. It's about constructing healthy diet patterns that are gonna stick with us and we're gonna be able to sustain. That's, the, that's what the important thing is here. So you've seen some of these foods, that's uh, salmon and avocados and, and things like that and nuts and stuff, and they're all great. Like these are all really important foods to include. So nuts and seeds, like hardly any of us eat nuts and seeds, hardly, but they're, they're amazing foods. Uh, we, all, we, we could all do with eating more fish and the recommendations are to try and include two fish meals a week and salmon's noted always because it's really high in omega threes, you know, but, but canned tuna is pretty good as well. But the oily fish seem to be better. So two times a week for fish meals, um, avocado is great. But there's the point about these is that they're they're all healthy foods. I mean, they're all they're all healthy foods that are part of a part of the five food groups, and it's how we put these together. And you would have heard everyone's heard of Mediterranean diet. That's the that's the one that gets. There's, the most research has been done on Mediterranean diets, so that's the one that we hear about a lot. But it's not just a Mediterranean diet way of eating. The, the, the things about it are that are consistent with other patterns of eating that we've seen are, are much better for people, better for the microbiome, better for the brain, better for longevity. 
are dietary patterns that are generally high in vegetable, not generally, but dietary patterns that are high in vegetables and fruits and whole grains. And they're also very low in all those processed foods as well. Not necessarily absent of alcohol, but they're low in processed foods. So processed sugars and processed meats and things like that. That's, they're the, it's a style of eating. So it's not about never eating that food and I feel I'm bad if I eat that food or those foods are bad. That's, that's not the message. It's the, it's the pattern of eating. It's the how we put these together. So the next activity that I, that I wanted you to do, to think about, is, is just thinking about what you eat. And it's about, like, it's about small changes as well here. So what are some small changes that you can make? So, so thinking about it, is there, is there a way that you could eat a bit more vegetable, for example? And I'm not saying oh, I'll write down I eat more vegetables. It's like, what's something practical and specific that you could do? That's a small change in your daily practice, daily eating routine, daily eating pattern that, that you could do. And, it might, and, it's, and remember, we're trying to move towards eating patterns that are higher in veggies and fruit and whole grains. So it might be for you, I'll, I'll eat whole grain bread sometimes, or I'll eat a piece of fruit in the morning, or I'll try and include another variety of vegetable in a meal, or, or put another veggie in the stir fry, or in the curry or something. Or, but, but I guess what I'm getting at there is if, if you can just find one or two very specific things that you know will work for you, and that you could walk out of here today and actually go and do. And don't think that that's not good enough, because it is, it is good enough. The scientific evidence around small changes that you can stick with is actually really, really strong. So you've all known people, maybe some, maybe some of us have done it ourselves, but you know people that have just thrown out the old way of eating and they go, I'm on this diet now, and they've chucked everything out and now they're just eating fruit and veg and they're, they're eating juice and but, but radically change the way they eat. And, and more often than not, that, that won't be the dietary pattern that sticks down the track because it's, it's too far removed from what your usual practice is. Sooner or later, culture and other, you know, I'm talking about personal and family cultures and things, will we'll bring that back, the food environment and what we've got to select from, that'll bring us back to where we used to be. So small changes, you think if you make a small change every couple of weeks, and then you can stick with that. You keep doing that over six. Where will you be in six or 12 months compared to where you are now if you want to change that? It's just moving towards those, those styles of eating, those eating patterns. It's not vegetarian. It doesn't have to be. It can be, but it's, but it's not. It's incorporating, incorporating all those foods into it. It's not about never, ever having you know, an, you know, a processed sausage or, a, or, you know, or chips or anything like that. Not at all. Not all, but it's just a kind of moment. We do it a lot of them. How can we kind of try and bring that back a bit and bring up the, now that we know that only 5% of us eat enough vegetables, how can we introduce a little bit more? Just spend the 30 seconds, if you haven't already, just one or two. One or two that you could walk away and look at after today. And then we're gonna move on to look at snacks. I think I'm doing all right for time. Yeah. Okay, let's, let's move on and look at snacks. So, looking at blood sugar levels, snacks are really important. So, to go for four or five hours in between a meal is a long time. And remember what's happening is your sugar level's going down, your body's releasing cortisol and stress hormones to try and get you to take action to bring it back up again. And so, it's trying to avoid that, to keep it at a you know, within that normal range. Normal. So snacks are very important, but what about what snacks? And I think Vicky mentioned the ones in the bottom drawer. <laughs> um, I think in my bottom drawer I've got canned chickpeas. So. <laughs> that, would be, that, that would be quite, quite, quite unusual. Um, yeah, but but s snacking is important. Uh, it is important, and it's important to make sure that they are the right kind of snacks. So, Ones, ones that are not high in sugar, they've got some protein in them as well as some carbohydrate. And carbohydrates, preferably 
in a, well, not preferably, they should be in a more of a complex form. They're slower, they're slower digested, so you get much, of a, much more of a slower increase in blood sugar. But when they've got a bit of protein with them as well, it, it will slow down that digestion and help to keep your blood sugar level at a, at a steady place. You don't want the spike, you don't want the donut, want the, but I did eat a cookie. <laughs> so there, it, it, we, all, we all go there. So here's, here's just a couple of ideas around around the, the snacks on the left and the sweet biscuits. I am a, I'm partial to them. Uh, and what, what might be some other, other options? Uh, and it doesn't have to be elaborate and, and too varied, but fruit is a fantastic snack. And we, most of us could eat, not, not, not in a juice form, but in the whole form. So fruit is a great snack. And I said nuts and seeds, I hardly any of us eat those. And they are, they are an amazing snack to have. They've got some carbohydrate, fat, protein, so they're a pretty whole mixed foods. Mixed, mixed food and they're, and they're good. Uh, uh, Craig said, this is an opportunity when you might normally buy the, the rice crackers, the refined rice crackers. So this is an opportunity to kind of go, well, could I try a whole grain version of a cracker? And just give it a go and see, what, see how that looks. Now, there's a way you can make a very small change without a big sacrifice in in terms of anything to do with lifestyle, but it, will, but it will make a difference in terms of your overall diet. And sweet drinks, we really don't need sweet drinks. Only occasionally. There are plenty of other... I, I like kombucha, I know it's expensive, or kombucha, if you say that. But it is expensive, but I buy it, I buy it when it's on special. In the, and so you get the bigger bottles and you get it at half price. And I won't buy it when it's $4 for a bottle from the shop. Um, so there are a couple of ideas about some, some snacking that you can make. I'm going to ask you shortly to just have a look at your, your activities again and just think about what you, what, what's in your bottom drawer, Vicky, and that you would grab and what you, might, what you might be able to do differently. What might be an option? And again, we're, just, we're small changes here. So can you, can you increase, can you put a piece of fruit in there somewhere? Just a couple of thoughts about snacks is that it's, it's really, it's quite hard to buy good snacks when you're out. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. You know, very difficult. So it takes a little bit of thinking ahead normally. And so if you can pack them and take them with you to work, then that's probably a great way to do it. Because if you go around to the 7-Eleven or the coffee shop, you're gonna be confronted with the big donuts and the cookies and the muffins, and there won't be much else there, <laughs> guaranteed. Uh, and pay attention to your to your, what your hunger is doing as well, and you know, just use that as a guide for you when when you should actually be eating. On the on, on your right there, just health star rating. So you may have seen that on package snacks. That's something mean, you can you can look to. The the more stars, the better. So you can look at if you look at muesli bars, you'll see some of them have got two, and some of them will be four and a half. Choose the ones that are got the more stars on them. If you're looking at the packaged foods because I'll be the healthy ones. Now the other thing I want to finish on today is just water and the, the importance of, of hydration. So uh, we all learned this in school, didn't we? Like how, how much percent of the body is water? 80% or 60, 50? Pretty high anyway, so you, you imagine like six, about 60% of the body is water and the brain, the brain's about 80% of by weight water as well. So water, again, is, a, is when we're talking about concentration, ability to focus and memory and to get the most out of, out of the brain as our go-to tool for productivity during the day and to feel vitality and to feel well, water is massively important and, and we, so you might ask me, well, how much water should I be drinking? And I'd be surprised if, if no one in this room hasn't heard eight glasses a day. Which is fine, it's, I mean, it's a pretty good benchmark, but it does depend a bit on what you're doing and the environment you're living in, but it's a, good, it's a good benchmark. I would suggest that how much water is enough? More than you're drinking now, <laughs> would be the answer to that. Most of us are in a mild state of dehydration most of the day. We could all do with drinking more water. And because so much of our body is made of water, all our, all our Processes require water. 
that just a fairly, a fairly small drop in your body weight over the day from, from water will have a big impact on your brain's ability to function. So it will slow down your reaction times, it will it'll slow, down, slow down all those processes that are required. So water is very, is very important. There have been a lot of studies done on this. People, people who self-report that I feel dehydrated also feel more anxious as well. And so drinking water can actually improve some of those types of feelings that we have. Now I think the final activity, if we've got time, the final activity is to, again, just, a, just a thinking about the small changes and some of the things we've talked about with, with snacks and with drinking. Going back to Samantha's point about the glass, you, you combine your, your uh, getting more water with getting some um, movement in your body as well. Uh, I tried that, Samantha. I, I tried that, and then I found that I wasn't drinking. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I went back to putting a bottle on the a bigger bottle on the desk. But I, I take your point. I tried. Very well. Yeah. So look, just spend thirty seconds. What we're looking for is one or two things that you can do that you know will work for you. That what is it? Is it that is it the snack at four p.m. or three p.m. or five p.m. You know, what is it that you could do? Could you, could you pack something from home and take it with you to work so you've got something that you don't have to... Remember the cookie. It's like if you don't have anything and, and the workplace has had a morning tea that day and there's cake and biscuits left on the bench, what are you going to be looking for at 4 o'clock in the afternoon? I don't know what you're looking for. <laughs> exactly what I would be looking for if I had nothing in the, in the bottom drawer. Right, so just make it out of one or two things again. Just it's got you've got to be able to stick with it. Right? So it's it's not a massive change. So I, can, I know I can do this, and I, and then you do it, and you keep at it for a few weeks, and then you do another thing, and think about where you'll be in six months' time compared to where to where you are today. So today we've sort of walked our way through a few different things. So we've we've looked at how it's how patterns of healthy eating can really make a difference to your energy levels at work and, and what that looks like in terms of blood sugar level. Again, just bring a bit of awareness to what that looks like for you during your day. And it's not about single nutrients, it's not about single foods, it's how we put these together in complex patterns that we do day by day by day by day. And we've seen the, the way that the typical Australian eats that and it's way out of balance at the moment and it's making us feel sick and irritable and depressed. And if you want to feel better, um, yeah, <laughs> sorry, I shouldn't say that. If you, yeah, if you, yeah, because not all of us eat that way, but if you, if you do want to have more energy and vitality, think about diet as a part of the picture as well. And we find, then we went on to, to finish on then just swapping out those snacks, looking at what we can swap, what we can swap in that, are, that is going to be higher in fruit, vegetables, and, and whole grains. And, and water. So one of your one of your steps that you might wish to take is Samantha's suggestion, and just use the use the glass of water and get up more often, and make sure you get plenty of drink more. Is the is the response there? So, just if you want more resources on anything to do with healthy eating and physical activity, we do have quite a lot on the health and well-being Queensland website. So you can go there. There's blogs. There's recipes that we put up there, healthy recipes, um, articles on, on way to do some of the things we're talking about today in a practical sense. So I would encourage you to go and, and visit our site if you're looking for a bit more information. And subscribe to our newsletter because all the good news comes out that way and you can follow us on, on social as well. Thanks everyone, I'd be happy to take any questions at this time. Obviously a stipulant, but like, how does that fit into the whole presentation? Yeah, coffee. So, um, yeah, it, it obviously makes us more alert. Um, yeah. So, what does that do with your regulation? So, um, yeah, it, it peaks our energy, obviously, uh, and most of us do drink more coffee than we need to. Uh, but what's it? I mean, one of the things that one of the sources that we do get a lot of additional energy from is sugar in coffee as well. So there's, 
you know, sweet coffees, like that can be quite a considerable amount of, of additional sugar in the diet. But say a, a, a two to three cups of coffee a day will not have an impact psychologically. So it becomes addictive when we, when we have more than that. And that's when you start to get the psychological dependence on coffee. And you Does get it give the, you a low though, in terms of the, some of the sugar stuff, you obviously the donuts give you that real low. This, this coffee, could that also give you a low? Yeah, no, oh. not, not in that sense. No, more as a stimulant for the brain. Yeah. It can improve your athletic performance if, if you're into that. And you're talking about coffee now. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed. Caffeine also dehydrates as well, doesn't it? So, oh, yeah. you know, your water and... Yeah, yeah, you'll have, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it is a diuretic, so, yeah, keeping your water intake, that's another good reason you can drink coffee. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Any correlation between the, your diet and your sleep patterns? Like, having good night's sleep, committing to having a bad diet? And... Yeah, that's a, a great question. So, sleep patterns also be caused by a whole lot of things, and and... People often say, well, why shouldn't you? you shouldn't eat a big meal late in the evening because that's going to impact your sleep pattern, but there's no evidence for that whatsoever. But if you want to get your, put your body in the best position that it can be in to work well for you, and then having regular meals and snacks through the day is the best way to, so if you want to, it, that, that would be the best place to get you into being in a good position to have a good night's sleep, as well as, as, well as other things that you need to do around that as well. So, it, yeah, it absolutely is related, but it's like, do I need to sort of not eat something? I mean, you know, if you have coffee in the afternoon into the evening, sure, that's going to impact on your sleep patterns, for sure. But is there any food, food I shouldn't be doing, or is there any way of eating, like, big meals in the, in the evening that I shouldn't be doing because that's going to impact my sleep? Then, then no, there's, it's not about that. It's about, it's about what you're doing through the day and what your eating patterns look like. Foods that are kind of shown to reduce stress or improve calm. I'm connecting it with, with its Yeah, good question. There'll, so there'll be some foods that actually do the dopamine response. So Pete was talking about that, and sugar is a good one for that. So you'll eat, you'll eat foods like that, and you feel calm for sure because you'll get a bit of a dopamine response. So so yes, that is, that is absolutely the case. But we can rely too much on that as well. And that, that's a part of the euphoria from eating something. That's part of the seductive nature of, of some of those foods that are waging war on our microbiome. Any good foods? <laughs> um, any good foods? I would, I would say it's more about the pattern of eating. So can you eat a food, can you eat a good food and it's gonna make you feel better? It's more about the pattern of eating. So. Um, no, I'm not aware of, say, so if I eat more, you know, nuts or something, then that's going to do it for me. Not necessarily so. Maybe it's, sorry, one thing. Maybe it's also how you eat in the process of, we rush meals, we mm. scoff them down, which gives us no slowing down. So the whole movement called the slow eating movement, which is all about savouring your food and eating it slow, that can calm you. So if you've got the balanced diet or the, what you talk about, and just think about how you're eating, not just what you're eating. Mm. Slowing down your chewing, appreciating the smell, flavour, a little bit more, that can calm us. Yeah, and along with, say, the mindfulness revolution, there's, there's, a, there's an equivalent for that with eating around mindful eating and just being aware of exactly what you're saying, how, you know, how you're eating, how many chews you take and what the taste and the texture and the flavours of the food that you're eating to, to experience them more and to appreciate them more. And that, that actually is a strategy that's used in weight maintenance, <coughs> weight loss and maintenance for sure. Good point. Thank you. Thank you so much.